Here we go. To all who fall is what I want to talk to you about. To all who fall. Those are Bible words. Those aren't my words. These are words going to come right directly from the book of Psalms. I, I, God seems to put me in theaters to preach at. Um, when people ask where, do, where is the church is in New York, I always tell them, I said, we're right across the street from Wicked. Go to Wicked and turn right. And so I said, we're right, we're right there. And for those that don't know this, one of the great things just happened this past spring. The longest, uh, the longest running show on Broadway just shut down. Phantom of the Opera just shut down. You cannot see it if you wanted to see it. Um, but now Times Square Church is the longest running show on Broadway to this day. So that's the good, that's the good news. Our theater in Detroit, where I pastored for almost 30 years, was a little bit different than the Broadway theater. For those that know, it was a pornographic theater that we turned it into a church. They ran the movies till the day that we bought it. And so people would always ask, you meet in a triple X theater? I said, we're still triple X. Ex-junkies, ex-alcoholics, ex-prostitutes all meet there, saved by the power of Jesus. So we, all, we, we do all that. I want to tell you a story of, of that theater that happened to me on the way to preach one Sunday. We lived seven minutes from the church. We lived in the city that we ministered in. It was called Highland Park, Michigan. It's the very center of Detroit. Detroit surrounded us. Um, we were at Woodward, which is the main street, and Six Mile, um, I was in Detroit because, because of Gary and Kelly. Um, Gary felt a burden to go to Detroit, planted a church right at the Brewster Project. Um, and then I'm in ministry today because of them saying, would you stay? I, was, I came for a missions trip. That's why we always believe in missions trips. What I thought was going to be two months ended up being 30 years in Detroit. So go on missions trips. I'm telling you, send them on there. You may never see them again. And someone's going like, we're signing them up. Um, you want to get them on that missions trip. But it was because of Gary and Kelly, um, of them saying, Tim, would you stay? I was on my way back to Baylor. They asked me to stay. And it was just that it's changed my life. And I'm forever grateful. He gets tired of hearing it. I know every time I say it, he puts his head down. I'm in ministry today because of those, because of Gary and Kelly. So we bought a, a 900 seat triple X movie theater. We lived at, the church was at Woodward and Six Mile. If you need, if you need context, it was Eminem talked about Eight Mile. That was the color line of Detroit. We were in to Six Mile. Um, and so to drive seven minutes was, was what we used to do. Um, the church was next to, on one side of us was a prostitution hotel that posted all of the hourly rates. On, on the other side of us was the, world, uh, um, was the Deja Vu strip club. And across the street was worldwide pornographic videos. That's where we were. So we were right in the center. So we broke all the rules of ARC when we went in there and did that. You're not supposed to do that according to the... To the thing. It's like what Brother Dave did. Brother Dave, they said, you can't plant a church in New York City because there's no parking. Tell that to David Wilkerson. But anyway, so 35 years later, I think we, I think we did okay. Um, so here's, here's what happened. We were, we were getting ready to go. I had a preach, and it was Communion Sunday. And while we're going, for those that know this, to all who fall, I don't, uh, we'll, we'll give you a chance to raise your hand if you're in that group, to all who fall. Um, the greatest moments to argue with your wife is Sunday before you're on your way to preach or before you're going to church. How many would agree with that? Would you raise your hand? So that's where it usually starts. It happens. So Cindy and I, um, we had some intense fellowship just before church. And, we, and, and I'm seven minutes away, seven minutes away. So we loaded the kids up and for seven minutes, it was deafening silence in the car. And I knew I had communion, which, which was the that was a problem because you have, to, you have to make sure your heart's clean and take communion. So that's problem number one. And then problem number two is that if, if we don't get this right, I've got to preach. With, and so I'm praying for seven minutes. I'm asking God to convict her because I felt like she was wrong. I'm going, God, you got to talk to her. God, because I got I to gotta take communion and I've got to preach. So God, just convict her of, of all that has happened. So I was praying that for so. Five minutes into it, folks, I, okay, I'm telling you the truth. I felt this heat, like I started sweating. And it was like this conviction, like I'm going, God, I've never, and two minutes are left. 
And I'm at this point, my whole body is on fire. And I'm just going, okay, I know it's me. I know it's me. So we pull up and I go, Cindy, I got to talk to you. I am so sorry. I repent. It was my mouth. I should have been kinder. I should have, I, I went through the whole thing. I said, and I have to tell you, I said, the reason why I'm repenting is God physically just set me on fire under conviction. I said, and I made, I said, feel, feel my body. It's on fire. She goes, I turned the heat seater on. And she said, that's why she said, you thought you're under, she says, that was me. (laughs) I thought it was the Holy Spirit. It was my wife, which is usually the same thing. And so what's amazing to me is this, is Even when you're getting ready to preach, you can mess up. To all who fall, even on the way to church, even on the way to revival, we're all part of this group. My favorite two words ever spoken by an angel are these two words in Mark 16, 7. But go tell the disciples and Peter. Those Two words, and Peter in Mark 16, 7, describe a second chance. Mark 16, 7, and Peter is the second chance. You would think that the angel may have said, go tell the disciples and Pontius Pilate, or go tell the disciples and Herod, or go tell the disciples and all the Sadducees and the Pharisees, because those were not just vengeful words that I told you so. For, For him to say, go tell the disciples and Peter, wasn't the I told you so. These are words of restoration. These are words of a second chance. This was a man who denied Jesus three times and his denials had had cursings and lies in them. And the angel said, go tell Peter in a sense that he gets to get up to bat again that we're gonna give him the puck, we're gonna give him the football, we're gonna give him the opportunity to get back in the game. And Peter wasn't a slam, it was an invitation again. That's what was happening to him. Let let me tell you this incredible second chance story that all of us are, that you may not even realize that you're enjoying a second chance story here today. You you probably didn't notice it. You look at a stage and you're going, wow, the summit team, that song that... that, uh, Pastor Teresa told me that the one song that you guys were singing today was the one that you wrote. I said, I know you wrote it. I was watching your video on YouTube um, on, the, on the one song that you were doing. It was, it's amazing. I watched it two weeks ago and sent it to Ricardo. I said, look at this. This is one of the songs that Ben and the team has written. Um, just amazing. But it's so easy to look up here that we forget that we're living under a second chance. If you look up, it's these lights are because of a second chance. 30 miles from New York City 150 years ago in Menlo Park, New Jersey, a team of about a dozen men took 24 hours to create the first light bulb. Because right in Menlo, New Jersey, was where Thomas Edison had his lab. He had a two-story lab, and it was there they took 24 hours to put together what you don't even notice in this place. 24 hours to, to put every detail and as I was reading this crazy story, it was from a book, I think it was the book called Uncommon Friends. It was the story of Harry Firestone, Thomas Edison, and, um, and uh, Thomas Edison, oh, I forgot the third one, and, um, and how these three men who really just changed a course of history all came, all came together, and, what, and Henry Ford all came together and what changed history with these guys? Tires, cars, and, and really technology. And it said that when they finished after 24 hours, they gave the light bulb to this young kid to take it up to the second floor. It was the presentation of the light bulb. And this kid had to, some of you are already groaning because you know the end of the story. As he's walking up the, the stairs and getting to the top, you're right, he dropped it. He dropped it. And, and so here you are about to change the course of history here and the kid drops it. So all of a sudden, it was Edison and the team of a dozen men go right back to work and didn't even go to sleep another 24 hours to put the next light bulb together. And if you haven't guessed it, Thomas Edison had the wherewithal to 
ask you know who to carry it back up the stairs. If I was one of those men, I'd go, okay, let's, let's all relax here. <laughs> let's, let's, let's not, or let's at least pray for him as he's getting ready to go up these stairs. And sure enough, he gives it to the same young man who dropped it the first time and he made it to the top. When you've worked on something that will change the world and it's dropped by a kid in a matter of a moment, who would give it to the kid again? Not just Thomas Edison, but it's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus had a light bulb and Jesus had a clumsy kid. The light bulb would be the church and the clumsy kid was going to be Peter. And what he was gonna do after three denials, when you hear the words, and Peter, Jesus, his stair drop would be the three denials. And after the resurrection, Jesus finds Peter and is about to give him the light bulb. And this is what we're gonna deal with. It's the message for all who fall. It's for all of us. I don't know if you're in this category, but I know I am. It's for all the light bulb droppers. Anybody in that category with me? Okay, half of you. Okay, you've, you've already failed because now you're liars. So let me just go ahead and we, so we can realize we've all dropped it. We've all messed up. Acts 2 is the birthday of the church. Jesus is about to entrust that day to the light bulb kid, Peter. And the great verse of Acts 2.14, tonight Pastor Carter is speaking on Acts 3 of Peter as he continues on because Peter gets to the top in Acts 2. In Acts 3, you're gonna watch the kid that, that gets to the top and Pastor Carter is gonna open it up tonight in Acts chapter 3 of what the kid who dropped the light bulb did. But Acts chapter two, verse 14, it just simply says these words, and Peter stood up. That's the top of the stairs. He made it. Because the same kid knelt and bowed to public opinion and to compromise three times. Every time he was challenged, I don't even know him. Let me curse so they wouldn't recognize me. Aren't you one of the disciples? Every time he's dropping the light bulb at that moment. And to hear the words in 2.14 of Acts, and Peter stood up, it's the top of the stairs. And Peter was now standing in the city preaching, where Jesus, preaching Jesus, where days earlier in the same cities, those knees buckled, the light bulb dropped, and he denied Christ. And I kept reading this, thinking about Peter. And I kept thinking to myself, how many times have I failed? And still yet he gives me the light bulb every single time. Like, who does that? It's what Pastor Nick Godshall said, that God, you're so much better than we can ever think. That's what, that's the truth. God is amazing because God doesn't just forgive us after failure, but God can trust you after failure. Listen to Psalms 130, verses three through four. If you, God, kept records of wrongdoings, who could even stand? As it turns out, listen to this, listen how the paraphrase, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase says it, verse four. But as it turns out, I love this part. Forgiveness is your habit, and that's why we worship. Let me say those words again. Forgiveness is your habit, and that's why we worship. Do you know why my hands are up today? Because forgiveness is his habit. How many are thankful for his forgiveness today? That's why we worship. So if, you, if ever you, you walk into a worship service, you're going, well, the music is not. I don't like those new fangled songs. I'm a hymns person. It's kind of like the guy who came to the pastor one day and he, and he just simply said, he said, I didn't like the worship service today. And the pastor goes, that's okay. It wasn't for you. And so it was for Jesus. So it, it doesn't matter really if you like the music or not. It's not for you. So if you need fuel to worship, here it is. Forgiveness is your habit, and that's why we worship. That's why you do it. So if a song is sung and you're going, I don't sing those songs from that group or for this person, and I only, we, just forgiveness is your habit. Jesus was making sure that Peter understood that there was a future for him. Who knows the percentages of sitting here of failed, dropped marriages, dropped friendships, Failed marriages, failed career choices, failed choices in our teen years or maybe in our college years. Failed in so many different things with the mind battle, given in to something that you're thinking to yourself. You're going, thank God we turned off electronics because I failed too many times on my phone, on my laptop, 
on my iPad. And some of you are literally afraid going, what if we leave this place? What when I get to turn it back on? Then what happens at that point? And you've been so used to dropping the light bulb that failure becomes a part of life. Everyone does it. Getting up from failure, everyone doesn't do that. But this is a day that I wanna encourage you that failure isn't final. That there are light bulb people all over this place and God is giving us second chances. Here's the verse, get this down. Psalm 145 Verse 14, listen to it. This is where I want you to hear it. I just wanna share just a couple of thoughts and we're done. The Lord sustains all who fall. Psalm 145, verse 14. The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. He's looking at not only the failure, but the posture of the person. The bowed down head is the posture of the failure. The, the, the head that goes down is the posture of the man that has messed up, the woman that has dropped the light bulb. But I love that phrase, all who fall. All shatters the idea of perfection, reminds us of our frailty. I have to tell you, Summit, I'm in that group. I'm part of the phrase all. I'm in that group. I've, I've dropped my share of light bulbs. I've messed up so many different times and God has been so faithful every single time that he doesn't just forgive, but he entrusts again because, because forgiveness is his habit. Thank God he doesn't keep score of failure. I wouldn't even be here today. I remember starting off in ministry, just my first time I have the light bulb, I'm pastoring my first church and God has entrusted me with this church and I'm the senior pastor holding the light bulb. And because we're meeting, it, it, it's, it's got a little bit of traction and story that we're meeting in this triple X theater and God is, seems to be doing something there. So I get invited to, to go to this Bible, Midwest Bible school. And while I'm there, they said, we want you to speak on a Monday night to all the students, all the church planters of the future. I, I couldn't remember who there, 50, 60 kids that all wanna be pastors and plant churches. And then somebody asked me the proverbial question that everybody always asks about church. This is the question. How many do you run in the church? That's the question everybody always asks you. And here I am as a new pastor. I'm holding my light bulb for the very first time. And at that moment, I'm just telling you, to be impressive, I exaggerate evangelistically. I took that, I lied. So what I did was at that time, but it wasn't a lie that you would figure me out. It was, a, it was an impressive lie that you wouldn't go like, oh, he's lying. Like I didn't use like a Nigerian church number. Like I it was just, it was, I was very careful. But, but what you do is I, I use kind of like a Mother's Day Easter number is what I did. And everyone's looking at me, and I know that nervous laugh because you've done it. So it's this, it, you use the, the Mother's Day Easter number, and I did it, and then, and so I used that number and rounded it off, is what I did. So, I, but rounded up. So I, I went to this number, rounded up, and as I share, and I said the number, and I was just going, we have whatever, you don't need to know. So we have this many, and, and as soon as I said it, the Holy Spirit said, you just lied repent. And I'm having this conversation in my head. Talk about all who fall. I'm going, this is my first church. And this is my first light bulb at this. And the Holy Spirit says, repent. I said, when I get back to the hotel room, I'm going back to my knees and I'm going to repent. And the Holy Spirit said, you repent right here in front of you. I'm going, oh, this is beautiful. They fly, they fly me in to train them. And oh, by the way, he's a lying speaker is what this is. So I'm, go, so I'm thinking to myself, so I'm fighting with God as everybody's staring with me. My mom, I, if you could see in my head, you'd go, you'd go, don't ever invite him back if you could see what was going on. And, and I feel the Holy Spirit. I'm going, why are you loud now? You couldn't be loud like when I need direction, when I need other stuff, but you're sure loud with conviction. You're really, and I hear him and I feel the Holy Spirit saying, First, I cannot anoint anything that's not truth. He says, because when you, when you exaggerate and turn to get a laugh or to get an applause, he says, then you're on your own with your exaggeration. 
He says, I'm not there, so now it's on you. And those things turn into bondage and you don't even know what to believe anymore. And then I felt the Holy Spirit said, and who gave you the right to round it off to the nearest thousand? And at that moment, I stopped with those students and I just said, I need to tell you, I've lied. I said, please forgive me. I know how many we had. I saw the numbers. This is how many we have in the church. And I don't know, what, what, I, don't know I don't even remember their response. And I just walked away and that was it. But I knew at that point, I dropped the light bulb. And I, and I have to tell you, I knew that there was probably a couple more points in the future that I was asked that same question and dropped it again and dropped it again and going, God, why would you even, why would you trust me? I can't even get the attendance right. And when I know what the answer is and I can't bring myself to say, we only had this much. We only had this much. I'm the light bulb kid, but God not only sustains the fallen, he lifts up their bowed head. When I just sit there and going, I said, I did it, I did it. God. And he goes, not only for all who fall will I sustain you, but I will pick up your head. And all of a sudden it was an encouragement that God could begin to come and do something like that. Folks, let me, give, let me give you somebody else in that all just so, so we understand that it affects all of us. You can't see today. You can't go to, to Cairo's museum and see the original Ten Commandments. It's not in the Smithsonian today. Can't go to the Smithsonian going like, ah, oh, those are the two tablets from, from Moses, those are the ones that, they, that we have built our cultures on and our morality on, the Ten Commandments. Um, you can't see it, look at me for a second, because he broke it. He busted them down. That's why you can't see it. Some of you are going like, Where, can we see the Ten Commandments? No. Talk about a royal drop of a light bulb. Like drop a light bulb, but not the Ten Commandments. And he didn't just drop it, he smashed it. And you think to yourself, God's, if you're God, you're going like, I just gave it to you. You're just coming down. The kid's going up for Edison. Moses is coming down for God and smashes it at that moment. And here is what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 10.2. Listen to these words. And he said, listen to them now. And God said he would rewrite the tablets, the same commandments, that were on the tablets, and it says this, that you smashed. That he would rewrite what you messed up. He would rewrite what you dropped. He would rewrite what you couldn't make it down, Moses, for just a couple days. Let the commandments at least be seen. He comes down, there's the golden calf. He smashes them. And, and here is God going, I'll rewrite the very things that you smash, that is a miracle, God. That's why I worship him, because forgiveness is his habit. Think about it just for a moment. What has been smashed and shattered in your own life? What has been dropped? And God begins to say, here it comes. That he says, let me rewrite that. There is a, um, Barry, would you come? I just, I wanna just get ready to close and I'm gonna give you a chance. I wanna share something just as we get ready to close to all who fall. <clears throat> Next to the Marvel series that's considered the greatest, the, the, the most highest grossing movie series is the now with all, you add all the animation, everything with the Star Wars series. I remember growing up in 1977 and going to a theater and watching Star Wars for the very first time on Long Island, New York. It was the considered to be one of the greatest sequels was the second Star Wars movie. It's called The Empire Strikes Back. It's considered to be the ultimate. But the story behind it is what gets me because it didn't, wasn't supposed to start off on some snow planet. Here's what happened. As they were coming to the end of filming Star, the, the Empire Strikes Back, the story says that Mark Hamill, who plays Luke Skywalker, was riding a motorcycle and gets into an accident that almost kills him. Not only did it 
that it stopped production, his face was so mangled that they thought they may have to start from the beginning because of the reconstructive surgery from the motorcycle accident. And they're looking at this and spiel, uh, George Lucas and is looking at this going like, oh my goodness. It's like, if we just have him finish the last scenes, it looks like a different Luke if we put him in that. And then he had a thought. He says, let's open the movie on an ice planet and let's have some demonic snow monster scratch his face. And so when you see Luke's other movie shots and you're going, wait, that doesn't look like Luke. You're not thinking motorcycle accident. You're thinking that's part of the script that just got rewritten in there. Luke is thought, wait a second. I'm the author of this. I can rewrite this whole thing to what it's supposed to be. Look at me for a second, students. He doesn't recast him. He rewrites the story. He doesn't recast and go, hey, you're out. I told you not to ride that motorcycle. You're done. I told you not to drop that light bulb. Delina, if you lie about numbers and attendance one more time, you're done. And God goes, no, 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 no. Watch me rewrite this. Look at me, look at me, look at me. What do you think Valerie was up here for? Valerie, where's Valerie? Valerie, Valerie's story, Valerie's story. You know why you're at Summit? This is a rewrite. This is a rewrite for you. This is God going, no, 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 we don't recast Valerie. We rewrite her. We're gonna make Summit part. So instead of putting you on a planet, Valerie on a planet, an ice planet in, called Haas, with a demonic snowman, we're gonna put you, Valerie, with a bunch of crazy godly students that love Jesus. And we're gonna rewrite your story right here. Why? You know why you can worship Valerie? Because he is in the habit of forgiveness. And that's why we worship him. He didn't recast you, Valerie, he just rewrote it. How can he do that? How can he do that? Here it comes for all of you religious people that don't even like what I'm saying. Here it is. Because for those that don't like this, then you don't understand what it is to drop a light bulb. You don't understand what it is to fight on the way to church. You don't understand what it is to exaggerate and lie about numbers in a church just to be impressive. And God go, and you go to God, I can't, I can't do this. And God goes, no, 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 no. I'm gonna trust you again with the light bulb. Okay, God, I'm gonna get this right. Bam. Okay, give it to me one more time. I'm gonna get this one right. And all of a sudden, what God does is he comes and he can rewrite this. Here it is. He is the author of, and the finisher of my faith. He can, he can change the story. You know why? Because he wrote my story. He can change your story. So just when you think you have blown anybody, so let me ask one more time. How many are part of the all who fall group that have dropped that, ah, now it comes. Now we're getting honest because it's revival. Stand with me at this point right here. He is the author and the finisher. Look at me, folks. You're not the author of your story. He's the one who's written it. And look at me. Thank God you don't have the pen in your hand. Thank God. He's the one. Some of you are sitting here today because of a rewrite. Some of you are sitting here today like Valerie, and it's a rewrite. Dr. Conlon was looking at me, I mean, told me and said, look up there. And she was pointing to our precious sister leading in worship and says, and reminding me where she's from. And she was, she was, she couldn't tell me the story because we were in the middle of worship and telling me, I don't even know your story. She just told me it's amazing, but I, but I have to believe you're here for a rewrite. You're here because God's going, let me, let me work this in. Let me rewrite all this and get you to where you're going. You're here for a rewrite. You may be on Summit staff going like, how did I get here? God's writing the story. God's writing the story. God knows what he's doing. For those that are visiting with us, whether you're a visiting pastor or an alum, hey, I don't even understand why I'm doing this. Let him rewrite it. Let him write, let him write. Some of you are not in ministry and you thought, I'm supposed to be in ministry. Look what I failed, I failed. I failed. Let, let God rewrite. He knows what he's doing. Forgiveness is his habit. And he lifts up the bowed head. But now we present to him and go, God, here it is. Here's, my, here's all the pieces to the light bulb. 
Here's all the pieces to the light bulb. I don't know about you, but I've busted a lot of light bulbs. I don't know about you, but I've smashed a lot of the things that God's going, okay, take care of these commandments. And out of anger, you drop something. Not even drop it, you smash it. Something has gotten in the way from marriage to mind, from relationships to our mouth. Something has gotten in the way. And God goes, please, let me rewrite this. Let me rewrite this. I am the author and the finisher. And to all who fall, he sustains all who fall. And today, let him lift up the bowed head and go, come and do something special. Here's what I wanna ask you to do in just a moment. I want you to get your hands ready as you're gonna, if you're here today and just go, God, I trust you to entrust me. These hands, these hands have dropped so many, these hands have messed up so many times. But God, today I'm getting ready to ask you to put the light bulb, put the church, put, put the future, rewrite, rewrite. Scars and all, scars and all over Mark Campbell's face. And God goes, watch me, watch me write a blockbuster with the scars. Watch me write one of the greatest sequels of all time with the, with, even with the stupidity of why would you ride a motorcycle that fast during the ending of the filming? Thank God we have a, a loving author and finisher of our faith today. If you're here today, student, alum, and visitor, and going, I've got some shattered light bulbs, but today I present it to him for the rewrite. I present this to him. If that's you, quickly, take those hands and come. Get down here as fast as you can for rewrites. For those that are rewrites today, come with me. I don't care if alum, visitor, whoever you are, Kelly, uh, Ricardo, Elder Vicky, just come. Just, just, just come. I want you to come. I want you to lead us. I want this to be open to the students today that they can come and alums and visitors. This is a rewrite today. This is a rewrite today. So here's what we're gonna do. This is why we worship today. Here it is. Friends, visitors, alums, pastors, leaders, and students. This is why we worship today. Here it comes. Once again, forgiveness is your habit. And that's why we worship you. So with your hands raised to him today, just with your hands, I'm gonna ask Kelly and Ricardo, I'm gonna ask Elder Vicky just to lead us. And as they lead us, we're going to worship because of who we serve today. And let him, and here's, would you just look at me for a second? Here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask us to do what Psalm 145 says, and then I'm done. And I'm let them lead us. And then if it's Pastor Nick or Dr. Teresa, whoever comes up and closes us, you can look that way. But here's what we're gonna do. Students, look at me. Visitors, look at me. What we do when we have fallen, what I do when I've fallen is this, but we're gonna let him lift up our bowed head today. So I'm gonna ask you to worship like this today. I'm gonna ask you to say, God, let take my head. You said you'd lift up the bowed head. You said you'd sustain all those, sustain. You know what that, you know what that word sustain means? It means that it's like a death hold grip. When I, I remember walking in the snow with my youngest one some years ago, and she couldn't get her foot feet, her, her footing in the snow. But, but it was okay because dad was holding it, the hand. It wasn't the snow that was in charge. It was dad that was in charge. That's what it means. He sustains all who have fallen. And he's gonna lift up the bowed head. Would you just take those broken pieces? Would you just, just lift that head up as Kelly and Ricardo and Elder Vicky lead us? Would you just go ahead? And we worship him because his habit is forgiveness. Come on, let's worship him for a moment.